Hi, I'm Stephen Lurson, artist and instructor in Charlotte, North Carolina, and today I want to talk to you about how you can evaluate your art, how you can consider your work while you're making it, to know whether or not you're finished or not. That's a question I get a lot, is how do I know when I'm finished? So, and then more importantly, whether or not your work is good. Now, it's easy to know how to evaluate photorealism, right? Because photorealistic work is trying to paint and render an image like reality. So, the evaluation is much more straightforward. Does it look like what you're trying to paint or draw? If it doesn't, if the nose is too big on the person, then you need to correct it. Essentially, it's apples to apples. Does it look like what you want? If not, you still need to work. If it does, you're done. Great. However, I focus more and specialize more in abstract paintings, non-representational paintings. My goal is to evoke an emotional response in the viewer without the necessity of a story. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to lead someone's imagination away to a story. I want to ideally uh, capture their imagination and grab their attention to spend a few moments with my work, draw them close so that they can experience it, and leave feeling different. That's my goal. And it is a normal part of every artist's experience and process uh, to evaluate their work to decide what the next step is going to be. Some of the insider languages I hear a lot is um, having a conversation with your painting. Now, no, it doesn't literally talk back to you audibly, but it is speaking, telling you what it's missing, what it needs, or what it has too much of, and therefore what it needs is to be edited back. Now, let's talk about the elements and principles of art, because before we can even establish um, uh, how you go about changing something, you have to know when something is missing or if you don't have enough of a particular thing. So I'm gonna knock out these elements really quickly because many of you are already familiar with them, but I don't wanna skip it because it's so foundational and so important. So you have line. Line in the simplest form is the connection of two dots, or three, or four, or five, whatever. Lines can be crisp and sharp, geometric, or they can be squiggly, they can be thick or thin. If you hear the term line weight, it's just how heavy or thin the line is, how dark or light the line is. Now next is shape and form. Shapes are typically two-dimensional versus forms, which are the illusion of three-dimensional. So a square is a shape, but a cube is a form. You can do that with almost any shape. You can turn it into a form. Some shapes uh, are not geometric, and therefore their forms would be organic, like a rock, a leaf, etc. Let's move on. Uh, after shape and form, we have color. Now, color evokes emotion. That's commonly known and used regularly in interior design. Uh, you don't paint the walls of a room red if you want it to be relaxing. It's not going to work. Same concepts go in painting. Um, so that's a key right there. Are you using colors that are in unity with your goal? Next, texture. Texture is just simply how your work looks like it feels. Uh, something can be soft and like the depth of field uh, concept in photography when one item is in focus and everything else is atmospheric and foggy. Uh, does your work have a variety of textures? Moving on to space. Positive space and negative space. There should be a balance of those. So positive space is anything that is a subject in your work and then anything else that is not the subject, like in this video, I am in the middle and I exist. I am the positive space and the space behind me, around me, is negative space. That's how, that, that's how you look at that in your painting. If you're zoomed in to an eye and there is no background, you've just painted this, then technically it has no negative space uh, unless you abstract it. And that way you can evaluate if it's feeling really heavy. That's probably why you don't have any negative space. But well, let's keep moving. Value. Value range is not the monetary value or how much it's worth. It is simply how light or dark it is. 
Here's a trick I love to evaluate your painting. Go ahead and snap a picture of it with your smartphone, then go in to edit that picture, turn it to black and white or remove the saturation. If your painting is all white, then it's not very dynamic. If your painting is all medium tone grays, there are no blacks, no whites, then your painting is not very dynamic. If your painting is all really, really dark with no lights, your painting is not very dynamic. A strong painting is typically going to have a wider range of values, light lights and dark darks. It's going to be easier to see. It's going to be easier to capture someone's attention from across the room. That's just a standard rule. You can break any rule if it's on purpose, but if you're not trying to make a soft, atmospheric, foggy light painting, if you're going for a dynamic pop and it's not having it, then that's how you know why. Now you understand that you just need to make your dark darker, boost your contrast. So that's the elements of art. Let's quickly move over to the principles of art. So does, does your work have any patterns? Patterns can be as simple as checkers like my shirt. Uh, it could be any repetitive element so that any individual element is not all alone. Emphasis is the next. Or focal point. Does your painting have eye magnets? Does your painting have an, a part, one part of the painting that draws the eye, that is your focal point, that captures the attention? And does it have backup singers, so to speak, that help support it and keep the eye in the work, moving it around? If not, if it's all the same everywhere, then people won't be captured by that as much, and they're more likely to move on because you're not giving, you're not spotlighting anything in that work that says, I am important, listen to me. If you do, then that's great. All right, uh, variety. Variety is my favorite thing to talk about with art. Does your work have variety? That is in color, uh, that is in scale, that's in mark making. And before I just start throwing these words out, let me talk, let me say what I mean. If you're using color straight out of the tube and you're not mixing, then you're not creating a variety of colors unless you bought a hundred colors, uh, which is great if you can do that. Um, however, if you have some green over here and yellow green over here, and then the blends go across, are there gradations? Are there versions? Are there al uh, alternate options of multiple blues, multiple greens, multiple reds, etc.? If so, then you have variety and that helps add interest to your work. It keeps it from feeling boring. Not only in color, but in scale. Do you have large elements? Do you have micro elements? Do you have detail? Without detail in your work, without that variety of size, People may see it from 20 feet away and feel like they understand it, and you're not going to fish for them and draw them close. They're not going to feel pulled in because there may not be that variety or, or necessity to look at it from up close. So if you notice that when you're making a painting, nobody is coming in close, then you're probably lacking variety and scale. You're probably lacking that detail, that fine print that's saying, come here, I have something to say. All right, so... That's enough about variety, I think you understand. Don't just have one thing, have varieties, have lots of elements and different versions of elements. Um, also, before I move on past variety, when you're making your painting, make sure you're not just using one tool. If you paint a large painting and you've only used one brush, by your very nature of your process, you are extremely limiting your potential variety and marks you can make. However, if you paint one painting and you're using 10 tools or 20 tools, brushes, uh, scratching devices, um, soft pastels and crayons and collage, and are you using a multitude of tools and media to amplify the variety within your work? If you are, then wonderful. If you're not, then maybe you're going for simplicity. But if you're trying to create diverse, energetic variety in your work and you're not getting it, maybe that's as simple as, as maybe that's how you fix it. Just use more tools, etc. All right, moving on. Unity. Does your work have unity? My favorite way to talk about unity is imagine with me in your mind's eye 
He painted a beautiful landscape, springtime landscape. Um, you have a pond, you have distant mountains, you have green fields with flowers, a few trees. Um, and then you lay your painting flat and you take a ketchup red and go right on one spot. Nowhere else, but you just squirt red right on one spot. You let it dry. When everyone looks at that, it's going to look like, oh my, what's wrong? What happened? What is this accident you have? Now, why would they call that an accident? Why would they feel like it's not supposed to be there? Because it's not unified. There's only one red splatter. It's not embedded. It's not worked into. It's not woven into the fabric of your process. It's just smacked on top. So it is very possible that you could actually repeat that red multiple places in multiple ways and then paint some landscape back over some and work it in. And then you take something that's not in the world, red splatters in the sky, etc., and you can make it work. You can give your painting unity. But if you just have one item of something and that's all it is, is just once, then you're sticking it in there and it doesn't have unity. It's not working. And that's why. So think about your work, even abstract work. It, does it have an element like that? Is it hurting your work? Or is it on purpose? Because I am very firm in the belief that you can break every rule in the book, ideally because you're doing it on purpose, because you want, you have a point, you have a voice, you have something you want to say, and you're breaking the rules to emphasize that. However, if you're trying to just paint a pretty painting or just paint a painting in general and it's not working, this is going to help you understand maybe there's some parts that need more work because it's not working yet. Uh, moving on to balance. Symmetry uh, is one way of looking at it. Is the right balanced with the left? There's asymmetry, which means you're on intentionally making it slightly unbalanced or very unbalanced, depending on what you're going for. But I think the key is, does your, does your painting feel, especially even in abstract work, does your painting feel like the top is the top and the bottom is the bottom and the, the left is the left and the right is the right? Does it feel like that? Or does it feel like you have your painting upside down on the wall? Does it feel like it's too heavy on top and it's going to collapse? Does it feel like it's too heavy on the left? Let's see my reverse. Is it too heavy on the right and it's going to collapse? Um... Or does it feel grounded and stable, nestled, secure, strong, firm? You can push and pull all of those things, but it's really about making it look like it works. Moving on. Rhythm and movement. A painting is a static object. But most of the time, we don't want it to feel dead. We want it to feel alive. How do you add rhythm and movement into a static image? Well, oftentimes you can repeat elements in similar ways that can work together as a cumulative team to give your, your static painting a sense of movement and energy and life and breath. Proportion. Proportion is, do you have objects working together and they seem like they fit well with one another? Or is there something out of place? It's too big and dominate, dominating the rest and it's out of proportion. You know, it's easy to talk about in a face and photorealism. If you're trying to paint my face, are my eyes the, way, the size they should be or are my eyes this big? However, you can reference Picasso, put the nose and eyes and ears and all that kind of stuff, moved it out of proportion, moved it out of place, changed the shape, and abstracted his work on purpose because it was part of his message, because it was part of his purpose and brand even. Um, are you doing, are you breaking the rules on purpose or are you breaking them because you didn't know the rules exist? Now you're able to do it on purpose. And when someone says, hey, that's weird, You'll explain why it's there, and that's a conversation piece. Or you'll notice it, fix it, so someone else doesn't feel like it's weird. All right, so those are the elements and principles of art and design. And these are a way, a framework, of being able to evaluate an abstract work and decide whether or not it's good or not from an objective, measurable perspective. Kind of like the um, scientific method of 
Does something work? Does it not work? Can you prove it? Can you justify it? Can you repeat it? All right, so that's kind of the academic background of how you can evaluate a work, even if it's not uh, telling a story or even if it's completely non-representational, just purely abstract. Um, that's one way to do it. A simpler way is by continuously asking yourself, do you like it? Move it down to a micro area of the work of art. Do you like that part? Do you love it? If you do, great. That part might be finished. It probably is. Do you hate it? Do you, is it dissatisfying? If it's dissatisfying to you, you're not finished. Keep working. You'll learn more from working on what you don't like than you ever will learn from happening to make what you do like. It will make you more competent and more confident and help you talk about your work in ways that you didn't, that weren't originally comfortable to you because you've worked through not only what you made, but alternatives and you've narrowed down your work to the best possible version of itself. All right. So that's the question of, do you like it or not? But also ask yourself, what is your intention with the painting? And is your work in line with, is it effectively um, meeting your intention? Are you trying to embellish your, are you trying to create a work that is energetic and free and wild? If you're trying to do that because you want to give it like this party feeling, but it's all smooth and peaceful, then it's not achieving what you want and therefore you need to work on that. However, if you're trying to create a, a spa-like, uh, zen, calm uh, work of art and it's filled with jagged, clawed-like marks and it feels it's emoting conflict, then it may be beautiful painting, but it's not what you're wanting and therefore you're not finished. And if you're struggling with how, how can I make this do what I want, then now you understand why it's not working and how you can fix it. Add peace to it if you want it more peaceful. Add more energy if you want it more energetic. All right, so I'd I've just gone through my process of how I think whenever I work. However, I'd like to give you a counterpoint from Leonardo da Vinci. And it's going to sound contradiction contradictory to what I've just talked about. And that's great because this is art. He said, a work of art is never finished, only abandoned. So my reason for saying that, for acknowledging a different perspective, a respected and authoritative perspective, is just to acknowledge that I'm one person with one set of perspectives, with one set of opinions, and that my art, no matter how beautiful, how big, how grand it is, is never going to make someone live or make someone die. It is not going to have a real uh, life or death power and therefore, you can make art that completely disregards everything I said, and it's great. However, if you are lacking in confidence, if you're lacking in competence, and you don't know how to grow, then definitely listen to what I just talked about and apply that method of thinking to your process, and you'll see that you'll grow in leaps and bounds. You'll see that you'll grow not only in your visual paintings that you make, but also in how you feel about them and your ability to progress and take the leap. Whereas before you may have stopped when you've gotten afraid of, oh my, I might ruin it. It's just paint. It's just paint. No matter whether you make it beautiful or make it ugly, you can always paint over it. So with that, I hope that that is encouraging. I hope that that information is helpful. If you found it encouraging and helpful, please like it and share it. And more importantly to me, I would love to hear from you in comments below. Please let me know how you evaluate your art. How do you know when you're finished? How do you know what to do when you don't like what's happening, but you know you can get better? What are your methods? I'd love to hear your comments below. And so thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day and happy painting.